A few years ago, I was referred to and treated for, well, till now even, by Mayo Clinic because I was diagnosed with severe PTSD that had resulted in some compounding pretty significant health issues that I'm actually still working through. So I take that very seriously, the whole PTSD thing. And besides telling me to remove myself from what was causing my acute stress to extend my life, they said, they also scheduled me for an appointment with what was called a stress clinic. And this was something that was inside Mayo Clinic and it was just called stress appointment. Well, I knew what my problem was. I knew that my response to it in fear was causing the problem. So I felt like I fully understood what was happening to my health. I just needed some help getting symptoms subsided. So I told them, I really understand why I'm in this situation and I don't think I need to go to a stress appointment. I just felt like I know a lot of things and I don't want to hear more things right now. And so they didn't agree with me. They felt like me being the way I was is because I didn't know a lot of the things that I needed to know. And so they told me I needed to still go to this appointment. So I ended up having to go to a 90 minute appointment called something about stress. So I go to this office where I'm supposed to be and the woman who is having the appointment with me apparently opens the door and I looked in her, her room and I, I thought I just landed. I wasn't quite sure what I just went into, but I saw bongo drums. I saw, I saw so many crazy things that I just, my eyes just lit up because I was instantly so distracted that I just started walking around her office, picking up stuff and thinking, what does this do? What does this do? What does this do? And you know, like a rain stick and there was all these different things that I thought, well, what does that do? But bright colors, there was a lot of um, fun posters on the wall that were interactive and it was just the most fascinating room I've ever seen in my life. And after about 10 minutes of me doing this, playing in this giant toy box, I stopped and I looked at her and I held out my hand and I said, I'm sorry, this was just, this was a lot. And I, I'm sorry, it took me a minute. And she's got her eyes wide open. And she said, my job is to get you to do what you just did. She said, now I'm interested in you. She says, I wanna hear more about you specifically because you just did what my goal is. And that is that you engaged at the moment with all of these things. Well, that baffled me. So I sit down because I already remember I don't wanna be here, but I thought, well, she sure got an interesting approach to stress. She's got this giant all this stuff just in her office. So I had taken some pictures of some of them because I thought I'm gonna get one of these. And I did end up getting a lot of the things. I ordered them. Um, this was, you know, kind of in the, uh, fidgets had come out, but these were big fidgets. These were really big things. And I ended up, um, so I would ask her, where did you get these? And she told me, and I told her kind of what my role was in life and that I, one of my most, um, one of the things that I value most is helping people when they're absolutely at the end. They're just completely spun out in crisis. They can't even think, can't make a good decision. That I, I become, that's, that's a moment where I really love to step in. And I felt like that room had something to it that I wanted to understand. So she explained to me that her role is to pull people present, to help their health, pull them present, get them 
I'm focused on this moment right here and now. And she said, I will tell you that nearly everyone who comes into my office does the opposite of what you did. They come in, they look at me, they look for the chair, they sit down, they kind of let me know that we're on the clock and then basically go. So she said, they don't notice any of this. They just come sit, what are you gonna tell me? Okay, bye, and they leave. And she says, what I end up telling them is the incredible danger that they are already in in their life. Because she said, the people that get sent to us, there was, I believe, one or two other people that do exactly the same thing as her there. Um, she said, the people that get sent to us are not, they're all within their, their height, performance, earning, and um, basically talent years for whatever occupation or career they're in. So she said they're all like in their, you know, their 50s or their, you know, somewhere in that middle age range. This isn't the same thing as where they would send a, a younger person for stress. This is a totally different program. But she said that they're already in, in having some significant health issues related to stress related to whatever processing information whatever it is and she said so they get sent to us because we need to warn them the window that they're in currently and where it goes from here if they do not immediately change course in their life and she said that well what she taught me was that the brain is created to default to threat and at that time, they were telling me that I was stuck in fight or flight because my heart rate had gone up so high and it was at a resting rate of 122, going up to 162 over the course of eight days. So they had tested it for that long. But the, so my, I, my system had gotten stuck in um, kind of like a panic attack, I guess. And that that part of the brain is and will stay strong and lit up in brain scans unless you intentionally build the opposite purpose. And Mayo has the team put together that works with executives who mostly come in at the top of their careers and earning ladders, but they have no joy, no meaning, no purpose, and they can't even remember the details of their previous week except that they're sure that they worked when they're asked about the dreams and the, the personal things going on with their kids at that time. Most of them cannot connect to that other than just basic facts. They're emotionally not plugged in. And Mail puts them on this program to drive their thoughts in a different direction for even 20 minutes each day to build the opposite of threat to purpose. And still, after give, being given all the warnings, they will say, I don't have time to do this, 20 minutes. The studies that Mayo has done show that this person who's already in this window that I was in when I walked in there will die 15 to 20 years earlier if they do not change this. Added to that, they will likely get some type of dementia prior to that even so the last she said up to 10 years are going to struggle with some kind of a dementia type problem and so she's telling me that you're in the window of the end of good quality of living right now unless you make immediate changes and sustain them this is it for you because now you're gonna go into foggy thinking of some sort because you're stuck in this and you can't sustain it, but you won't take steps to get out of it. Many don't. And then you will die 15 to 20 years later because you already have heart issues. You are basically a candidate for a stroke at this time. And so she's saying, you're at the end of your window. It's all downhill from here. Well, she had my attention. But she said most will take that and then they're like, okay, great to meet you, leave, and she never sees them again. They never come back. 
She gave me an assignment to do. She said, this is what I will start with, other than giving me a lot of tips and, and different things. And I, I really kind of gleaned a lot of information from her because I felt like I'm, I'm in this window because of whatever's going on in my life. But I know a lot of people that could benefit from this kind of an interruption in their life. Just walking into a room that's filled with amazing things to play with. And I wanted to turn my office into the same thing, which I have done ever since. Anyone who knows me knows there's toys everywhere in my office. And people come in and they're mad because they come to me because something bad is going on or they're upset about something. But they come in and they stop and they look around just like I did. And then they go pick up something and then they start fiddling with it. And then, then we don't even end up talking about the thing that they probably came to talk about. It happens a lot. We do sometimes get to the topic because I'll say, what did you come in here for? But it's a lot easier to go through it at that point because they're focused on this gadget, whatever it is that they picked up. So I got a lot of tips and tools from her, but I also received a, a first level first thing she would give someone to do to see if they're actually going to engage the program. And to me, it reminded me of the gratitude project where they have people at the end of every day, write down three things you're grateful for. Well, some of us that I'm, I'm really grateful for like, even when it's not going well, I, I'm one who has in some crazy way, I believe since I came to Christ, even I have always been able to see just how incredible life is, how I see the good side of most people. I just have, I love watching things go on. I just, I just really enjoy life. And it's pretty hard to knock me off that because plenty of bad things happen, but I, I really have an ability to see the good. So doing a gratitude list for me is somewhat, it, it just isn't challenging to me because I really can list many things a lot. But her, it, her assignment was not about that. It was to pull people present in their day. And so she said, every day throughout the day, you need to write down three things from start to finish, wherever that was, three things that you observe in your day that pulled you completely to attention on that thing. Like, did you see a car accident in an intersection that you just like stopped and all eyes were on that and you're assessing what's happening? She said, whatever it is, three things every day, three things that totally pulled you out of your, um, whatever you're doing up in your head that is not present, but three things that pulled you completely from that. And then what was your role in that event? Were you an observer? Were you part of it? So put what the event was, describe the event, and then describe your, um, how, how you were involved in it whether whatever role that was which was kind of intriguing to me because i thought that's nobody's ever brought that up like i've never had anyone give me that kind of assignment but i could see i could see why it would work because it starts to make you uh, subconsciously even start watching you start watching for things that are going on around you and i could see how that exercise would pull you, it would start to pull your thinking a different direction. And so it wasn't just the assignment, but there was many things that I learned from her in that period of time that I will never forget her. And I, I found for someone in a, in a, it wasn't a faith thing. And I know, um, some people, you know, don't always value the wisdom that comes from the non-faith community, but I do. And I was, I was just completely captivated by 
all that she put together for me there. And it changed a lot of things for me. It did change a lot of things because I really think about it a lot when I'm trying to help someone else and I'm always putting together things to try to distract them from just to keep pulling them back out of their tragic thinking. The problem with us as people is that we know being present is important because when somebody doesn't be present with us, we're very frustrated with that. So we know that those of us who have a hard time being present because we are doing so many things, we're the first ones to get really frustrated when somebody just keeps reading their phone or watching whatever it is when we're trying to talk to them. We're the most offended by the thing we do. So we know it's important. You can ask any child who has the television as their parent. You can ask any employer about their employees. Many of them now have um, software on their um, computer systems because they can see just how much, how much just loitering is done on the computer by their employees. They'll just, they can see how much. And I know how frustrating that is because I've gotten the numbers before. But being present means to be focused and engaged in the person or task at hand. Focused and engaged. And we live in a world where we're just bombarded <clears throat> all day, all night, every day with distractions and demands. A lot of that through media, social networking, e-communication. There's just so many different ways. I think I've got like seven or eight ways that people can message me now on my phone. It's just mind boggling what I've done to myself with that phone. We're delusional to think that with all of this technology, we can multitask and do five jobs instead of one, be five places instead of one. I'm one who has said that many times, that I can do 26 things at once, I'll get them all done. I, I'm one who, re is ridiculous in saying things like that. The reality is, is that a person cannot multitask and be fully present at the same time. You cannot. And the Bible says regarding being present, the best verse is be still and know that I am God. The Hebrew word for be still literally means to cease striving. It means to push the pause button, let go of everything else in your life at that moment, and focus on God. That's what it means. And to be present means to first ask God to be present in our lives and to focus on his presence, to fully be present in any situation or relationship. We have to start there because without God, we don't even have the ability. There's no way to rein in our thoughts. Our past is our past. It's where we came from, but we are not supposed to live in our past. Our future hasn't arrived and no one has it promised to them. We certainly should not be living in, that is total fiction. All we're promised is what we have right now. The present moment is the only real moment. The present moment, the rest are not. So don't dwell on the past or wonder what you'll be doing in five minutes, five years, be present, be here right now and completely here right now. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20 in the Message Bible says, after looking at the way things are on this earth, here's what I've decided is the best way to live. Take care of yourself, have a good time, make the most of whatever job you have for as long as God gives you life. And that's about it. That's the human lot. Yes, we should make the most of what God gives, both the bounty and the capacity to enjoy it, except what's given and delighting in the work. That's God's gift. God deals out the joy in the present and the right now. Joy is a right now. It's useless to brood over how long we might live because nobody's going to get that right. You have no idea and instead you end up sick brooding over it. People just end up with no life at all, even dying young. I know at least two off the top of my head that always said, I won't live to be 40 because their 
one of their parents didn't. One, the mother had brain cancer and the other, the dad died of a heart attack at 39. And so they were saying, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna live to be 40 either. Neither one of them did, but they didn't die of what their parent died of either. So it's very dangerous to actually obsess about things like that because you can get, you can bring that to pass. Your body follows your thoughts. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and stream, streams in the wasteland. Hebrews 13, five says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Romans 12, two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worry for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Psalm 118, 24 says, This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of, best use of time. There are two types of time talked about in the Bible. The Greek words for time are Chronos and Kairos. Each translates to the word time in English, but they're different. Chronos is time that continually moves from the past through the present and into the future. It's the time that we measure by clocks and calendars. It's the time that ends up dictating our lives. If it is in this sort of time, you can't interfere with it. You can't move it or stop it. You can't control that kind of time. Kairos, the other Greek word for time, describes a present moment in time. It is now. Kairos is a moment in which something special takes place. And unlike Kronos, Kairos is not measured by quantity. In speaking of Kairos, we are always speaking of the quality of the time. In Mark 1, 14 through 15, Mark, the author, gives us a summary of Jesus preaching. And in that message, Jesus says that the time is fulfilled. The writer Mark chose the word kairos, not chronos. In using kairos, Jesus is thinking not so much about the movement of time to this point, but rather he's speaking of in terms of now. He's saying this moment in time is the time. Jesus is indicating that the present is what matters. And although the future is promised by God, the present is what matters. The present, the past is remembered, the future is hoped for, but it is the present moment that is of great significance and urgency in God's eyes. And this is why Jesus calls us to repent and believe now is the moment of salvation. Now is the moment to repent and believe. He doesn't have to offer anything else but the moment now. And if we hear that, we do have that moment. We have right now to do it. There isn't guaranteed another now. But most lives, they live, most people choose to live in chronos, the time that moves on. Most people move with time or they let time move them. And we allow Kronos to direct how we live our lives and often it is used to simply devour our lives, all the good that could have been. We let it be a, become a devourer. Jesus calls us to live in Kairos time, seeking and searching for God with each breath we take and with each moment that goes by. And in being in the present, we're fully present to God and fully present to others, putting away the distractions that pull us away from God that lead us to living a self-centered, self-fulfilling life. That is the opposite of following Jesus. 
Jesus models this in healing people. He was driven by his sense of presence, also his sense of God's presence, and also his sense of presence of those who needed healing. He did not see them as people who just wanted to be healed. People often categorize others the way of they just want this, they just want that. But Jesus doesn't do that. He saw that they had a longing and that longing could be met by God and he brought that to them. Those healed experienced the presence of Jesus while those standing around watching and making those comments would say, who is this about Jesus? Jesus made known that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Only the present moment is real and available to us. Nothing else is real. The past is gone, the future is fiction. The peace we desire is not in the future, but it is something we can only have in this present moment. And only a few have learned how to actually do that in this life. Most live in between, not brave enough to fully live in the present moment. They know it's there, but they won't get there. They're terrified to live in the present. Being present does not mean that we forget the past, forget about planning the future, or speaking cliches about how amazing life is right now. That's not real. The present life can be sad, it can be lonely, tragic, but the present moment is all that we have in reality. The past is a memory, although it did make us largely who we are today, our future is unknown, precarious, and it's not promised. Only in the present moment can we find our real power as people and really live. Only in the present moment will we find our true connection to God too. That's the only way to find him is now. Jesus would often scold his disciples for not being present with people. They would complain about how much time Jesus spent with the people or they would often want to send them away because the people were so annoying. Jesus told the parable of the sower as an example of being present in Matthew 13. He speaks of seeds being sown. Some land on rocky ground, others on thorns, still others on good soil. Those on rocky ground hear the word but fall away at the first sign of persecution and trouble because they have no roots. Seeds that fall among the thorns yield nothing because they get caught up in the cares of this world and they forget what the word of God says. The seeds that fall on good soil will bear fruit because they heard the word, they understood the word. The meaning is that those who live in the future live on rocky ground, they have no roots. They're always thinking about one day when I'll be happy, one day when I'll be rich, one day when I have the perfect spouse, Still others find themselves among the thorns of the past, stuck in the remember whens that overwhelm their future and their present. It ends up destroying every part of their life. They've made decisions and judgments about life that are never going to allow it to be enjoyed. But those who fall on good soil realize that the word is the present moment. The word gives life. It speaks to our innermost being. It builds strong roots and it bears good fruit. We are all planted in good soil. We must realize the power of the present moment to build strong roots, bear good fruit, and live a life that is vital, alive, and awake. And a lot of people feel like some are born into privilege, others are born into a, like a coveted um, race or, or family of money, different things, but the truth is those who were brought in by bad soil or ended up there somehow, they were not chosen or predestined for a bad life. They also must realize they can choose good soil of the present moment and grow strong and flourish in that. So just because a bad hand was dealt as a child, some of the most Amazing people I know are the ones I admire the most who are so purpose driven, who are so passionate about their cause. That's exactly what caused it. Suffering as a child. Something happened. In my life, it's very similar. It isn't, 
a lot, it, there's two different windows of time growing up and then my own behavior that became incredibly traumatic. But between the two of them, I have so many different passions and ways to connect with people in crisis. The soil from the worst times of my life grows amazing fruit. That's just the best thing that I have going for me. Few people then and now fully understand that Jesus warned us to be present at all times. And we fear being present because it demands from us that we must see, hear, and understand what is going on around us. We, got, we have to wake up. We can't be lazy. We can't be um, sitting around wasting our lives. So many people are wasting their lives. They're making money. They can't take any of it with them. Their children end up oftentimes not respecting the money and wasting the money that their parents work so hard for. I like the quote that says, is what you're living for worth Jesus dying for? We have to decide this one life that we have that Jesus paid for with his life, how are we stewarding that life? Because we will answer for that. Every single person will answer for what value did their life have to them. And being present is a rigorous demand. A lot of people don't like it, but for those of us who were crashed into a wall and had to realize it, it's incredible to be able to walk in that. We must not only notice the things going on at this very moment in our lives, but then we choose to appreciate them. Some of them, we were just talking tonight about something that certainly isn't a good situation, but it's causing us to think about things in a different way and to walk in faith like we've never had to before. So we can see the good fruit of a very bad thing. And so I remember doing an assignment I went to a training to learn um, a different technique. It's called a DBT. And I remember they split the room in half. They took, it was a bunch of people, none of us knew each other anyway, but so there's, they took half the room and put them, took them out into a different room and then left half of us in the room. And then they told those of us still left in the room that the other group's going to come back back in they're going to find somebody's going to find you each person has to find another person and then they're going to tell you some really exciting thing that they have to share like legitimately they've got this this news they've been wanting to say to someone and they're going to come and share that with you that's what they're being instructed to do they're not like making it up they're, this is a serious assignment for them and they're being prepared for us to like use talking skills or something but what we're told is when they come and they start doing that, once they get talking, then like get up and go get coffee or start checking your phone or just start fiddling with your papers, writing down notes of what you got to do later. They told us just keep distracted and just we're, they were going to observe. And I am telling you that for a bunch of people who don't know each other, the amount of rage in that room was not hard to, that's what I mean. It's like people like us who got so many irons in the fire and then we're just furious when someone is doing that. But that's how impactful it is. And you think often of kids, how many times they're just pushed to the side and given a clear message. You're not important. I don't care what you have to say. Often ha happens to employees, um, there's just so many different ways in life that that is now common, that I don't need to hear from you. Be quiet. I've been told that plenty of times. Often we forget to notice what's present because we're thinking about what we did yesterday, what we did 10 years ago, what we will do in five minutes, what we will do after work. Being present means we let all of that go and we focus on what is happening right now around us. And for those of us who 
to script write all of our former choices, even the ones five minutes ago about why did I just say that? I wonder what they thought I just said. And we're just ruminating on this thing that's like out the gate long time ago. We just get stuck there over and over and over. We just spin it. The person will say, oh, I, I didn't even catch that you said that <laughs> if we do ask. It was of no significance after you stay up all night. When we are truly living in the present moment, this is what's amazing. There's no anger, irritation, or unhappiness. The present moment is actually void of these emotions and problems. It only knows that moment, that being alive that moment, it can know joy and ease. And as soon as you pull yourself into that present moment, unhappiness, and struggle dissolves and life begins to flow. So oddly, I realized that it would take a lot of words to put around that whole thought to speak to depression, but depression is the, I'm not saying every kind, but most kinds, the kind that's a thinking problem is an inability to stay present. I think a lot of us could benefit from getting rid of a lot of these toxic emotions with a choice to fixate on the present and learn how to do that. It's worth looking up. It's worth looking into. It's worth coming up with ways to keep bringing yourself present. Wayne Dyer's book, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem, states that the present moment is a moment where there is peace, happiness, and no struggle. He calls us back to the present moment when life becomes overwhelming, and he calls people to this phrase, I can choose peace rather than this. And he recommends using this phrase when you find yourself experiencing anguish, fear, depression, turmoil, and even anger. This phrase seems to be denial to some of us, like it feels like denial, but if we are in fear, depression, turmoil, or anger, aren't we just turning off our real emotions at that moment and giving into a denial already of sorts? Then we make it all look like we're okay because if somebody says, how are you today? We say, we're fine for the most part. There's so much denial already going on in us that this would be worth testing as not being denial. Dyer says this technique will not immediately mend a broken leg or undo an accident or rid your house of termites, but you will have proven to yourself in that moment that you do have the power to choose peace. You can live, you can choose to live in the present moment of peace, or we can choose to be ruled by our emotions of anguish, fear, depression, turmoil, and anger. You can not live in peace. And this is a choice we all make every single day. We choose to be depressed instead of happy. We choose to be angry instead of calm. We choose to be lonely instead of content. We choose how we will think and feel. And so often, we would rather have anger, fear, and anguish over peace and happiness because that's what we choose. We choose anger, fear, and anguish. We keep saying we want peace and happiness, but we keep choosing anger and fear. And choosing peace and happiness is not a denial of our anger and fear. It is a change of which emotions are we going to choose. Dyer says when we choose to bring that peaceful thought to bear on the presence of whatever problem you are experiencing, you will discover that problems can only be experienced in your mind. And when you bring peace to your mind, you put yourself in a mode of taking whatever action is appropriate because now you're thinking not out of emotion. So choosing peace in any situation is not a denial of the situation or inaction. It's a transformation of how we use our emotional abilities. A conscious choice that puts us in the middle of the present moment where we can take appropriate action to deal with any situation that comes along that is the power that is in the present moment. We must make choices when we see that situations in our lives are the source of our struggle or are making us unhappy because there's no struggle or unhappiness in the present moment. So if you're complaining about something and you're not making one of these three choices, leave it, change it, or accept it, 
then you're denying the present moment. And if you can't remove yourself from the situation, then you should try to change it. That may require action on our part or change your attitude in the situation. That's another possibility. Try to see the view from how those others are seeing it. Change the way you think about the person you're in conflict with. A lot of times helping people work through forgiveness um, and letting go of resentments is really effective in how circumstances change and people groups get along. If you change your negative feelings about a situation and focus on being present, situations can seem to suddenly change on their own without much effort on our part. If we cannot leave or change it, we need to accept it. And in doing that, we have got to work to drop all the inner resistance that is causing us to be sick. You need to just let it go if you can't do anything about it. It's kind of like people who are on this continuous, I don't even know what to call it. It's like, I, I'm not stating an opinion about who won the election, but that election has never stopped. It's been three years almost. And we're still, many people are still active in that event. And that's one where I would say people need to make some kind of a decision to move forward. Not about anything political, just we really need to keep our lives moving forward and not entrenched in something back that far. I want to share um, what is called Eight Be Present Attitudes, written by Tom Stewart that he discovered from studying the Bible and eight ways he calls them to improve our ability to truly be present in every circumstance. In fact, in six out of the eight, the verse used is an illustration that literally tells us that these respective attitudes are to be done at all times and in every circumstance. One, be focused. This is paramount for presence. And there are several key verses in the Bible that exhort us of the necessity of focusing our thoughts and minds. We're told to fix our thoughts on Jesus and to set our minds on the things above. We are also exhorted to be steadfast of mind. I'll uh, put these in the comments. I'll just put this whole section in the comments because there's references to each verse. To be watchful, not enough can be said about how important it is to be alert and discerning. Again and again, the Bible tells us to be fully awake and vigilant, seeking to see the things God is seeing and wants to reveal to us. Jesus told us to keep watch. Paul said to be watchful. Many people are part of the kingdom and they honestly have no connection to what God is doing. They don't experience anything like that. And that would be in this case that that's crazy because he's definitely trying to interact. Three, be content. Being content with the moment you are in and not wishing for some other moment, either past or future, will help you to abide in the present. And this is something we can learn by choice and by practice. And Paul tells us, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Four, be thankful. Be content. Being content and thankful go hand in hand. And so it is possible to be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong in Christ Jesus. Five, be prayerful. When the moment we are in is not a pleasant one or is very trying to our patients, we always have the option of turning to God in prayer. And prayer enables us to be present when other things around us are at war. Prayer also helps us to be more discerning, to find God in the moment. We should therefore be instant in prayer and pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Six, be strong. It takes perseverance and strength to endure difficult moments we sometimes find ourselves experiencing. God is always there to help you to be present and not retreat by longing for the past or wishing for a preferred future. Many times in the Bible, we hear the words, 
be strong and courageous. Seven, be loving. Be present in the moment. Being present in the moment is greatly helped when we focus on and think about others before ourselves. It frees us from self-consciousness and self-pity. Do everything with love, the Bible tells us. Trying circumstances are always transformed with love. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. And eight, believe, so trust in the Lord at all times. The psalmist tells us, and faith is a non-negotiable when it comes to being fully present. Without it, it is impossible to please God or live victoriously in the moment that we are in. I'm going to locate that assignment because I actually made a worksheet of it that will help just as a, I'm, go, I'm gonna find that. I'll put that in the comments also. So this is incredibly challenging for me, this whole area. I told them, I don't even know how I came on this subject, but it's definitely something that I, if I wouldn't have been brought to this point, it's hard to say where I would be now. Like I, it's hard to say health wise. I, I'm, it was collapsing then. So it's hard to say that changing how I looked at things and what I looked at and it absolutely probably saved my life. So I just hope that it's news to a lot of people like me when I first heard it. It was, it was intriguing and it was good news. And if you want to ever see pictures of all some of the funnest toys that I got the idea from this woman, I would be happy to, to let you know what those are. A lot of them came from Amazon. If you search um, relaxation, um, anxiety, stress, you'll start to see that that's become a pretty big area of marketing and there's a lot of new things all the time. So, but it's really good for people that are in great distress because it pulls them out of that quickly when something else might not work right away. So I'm really interested in this area and always eager to talk about it if anyone wants to do that. Precious Lord, there's just so much complication to us as humans. We, we so easily can destroy ourselves to absolutely shorten our life by great, great measure and make this life nothing compared what to what you imagined it would be the price you paid for it and then we just go chase after some cheap strand of pearls instead of really making an impact for eternity I ask that you jar us all into reality that we would know the value of our own life to you not even necessarily to us but to you the value of our life and give people a sense of if they were in their purpose how exhilarating their life would be even if it's working with people completely crashed like i do it is still i am right where i want to be with you jesus i have nothing else to offer so I ask that you work miraculously in people's lives that they would recognize I'm wasting my life. And I'm also not gonna live long because I'm not even present in my life. I'm not even paying attention to the people in my life. Help people to assess the reality of what's important to them by where is their time and their money going. So help us, Jesus, to be all about your business in these last days. Help us to not waste our time. Help us to not let anyone slide into hell that we could have influenced to get to heaven. Please help us to pay attention to what is real in this moment. Thank you for all of the different ways that you keep trying to intercept us, and I ask that we don't miss any of them. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.